So if I can request uh, both uh, Paul Shapiro and Deborah Ehrenberg to come up on the stage. Thank you. Yes. So I think we have a great panel here tonight talking about the future of animal rights. And so uh, I'm just going to jump right into the panel now. And so our first speaker is going to be Paul Shapiro. And uh, okay, somebody can help with the AV to get uh, a little block. Can you take the block out? Okay, great. Okay. All right, so our first speaker is going to be Paul Shapiro. And uh, Paul Shapiro, if you do not know, is actually an inductee of the Animal Rights Hall of Fame. He's also won the Henry Spira Grassroots Activist Award and also the Young Animal Activist Award. So if any of you were in the ceremony yesterday, we'd given out numerous awards. Well, Paul has actually won three of those awards. He's the Vice President of Farm Animal Protection at the Humane Society of the United States and has played an integral role in numerous successful legislative campaigns and corporate campaigns to promote vegetarian eating and improve the plight of farmed animals. He founded Compassion Over Killing in 1995 and served as its campaign coordinator until early 2005. I think I met, I met Paul just about, right about that time in 1995. I believe that's, yeah, I, and so he's been interviewed in hundreds of print, broadcast, and online news sources as an authority on farm animal protection and animal advocacy. So I ask you to please help me welcome Paul Shapiro and give his thoughts and vision. Thank you guys. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate that. It's great to be with each and every one of you here at the conference. I want to make sure that you all give a warm round of applause to our moderator, Saurabh Dalal. This guy has been a leader. Look at this man. Look, this guy has been a leader in the vegetarian movement. He's been a leader in the vegetarian movement for decades. Yes, ladies, he is single. And so you can meet with him afterwards. I also want to make sure that we give a warm round of applause to the organizers of this conference, Jen, Michael, Alex, the entire team at FARM. These conferences do not put themselves on. They require months and months and tens of thousands of dollars and enormous man and woman hours to put on so that all of us can come here and get involved. I don't know what happened to Jen's body. Something weird happened in there. <laughs> but. We got you in, don't worry, Jen. But they're doing, you know, anybody who wants to be critical, that's really, you know, they've done a great service for all of us and for animals for bringing us all together. So give them another round of applause. <clears throat> I'm also very glad that we had the award ceremony last night. Henry Spira, a hero of mine, I want to give a big shout out to all the award winners. Martin Flanagan, the young gentleman who has won that award. The great activist Brad Larson, who I know is in here, and Nick Cooney, fantastic activists. Couldn't be more well-deserving of their awards last night. Brad was one of the key activists on Prop 2 during California's 2008 ballot measure, one of my great heroes of that campaign, Brad. And of course, Joe and Colleen, who certainly deserve to be in the Animal Rights Hall of Fame. Did anybody catch and I catch my own brother, Ryan Shapiro, that he was up in here. Did anybody see his talk on the, the FBI's involvement in our conference? I was personally very glad that, to have my brother here. It's, he told me it's his first AR conference in eight years, I believe. And yesterday, for the first time in about six months, so this has now happened to me twice this year, somebody in my talk yesterday actually asked me and said, hey, is Ryan Shapiro your son? And I said to him, I said to him, I, you mean my brother? And he said, no, no, I, I heard he was your son. And this actually happened to me like six months ago. And so we decided to see what it would look like if, I, if he was my baby boy. This is what we were doing, is me <laughs> delivering my brother Ryan. Give him a round of applause. In case you were wondering, we are going to actually talk about winning the future for farm animals here at this plenary. Um, we're gonna talk about it because that's obviously what we're all here to do is to win. Now, before we look at the future, let us look at the past. Here's The Economist talking about us, the kings of carnivores. Here's a chart looking at the world's biggest meat eaters, and you can see the United States perched almost right at the top of all the countries in the world. Only Luxembourg outdoes us when it comes to meat consumption. I don't know what their heart disease rates are there, but I'm sure that they're probably pretty high. Um, however, keep in mind, 
This is a 2007 chart of meat consumption. We can then look and see from 1984 to the present, meat consumption in the United States increased, increased, increased. In fact, since World War II, every single year virtually, meat consumption has increased in the United States. But what happened in 2007? In 2007, meat consumption in the United States dropped off a cliff. Indeed, you can look and see, this might be hard for you in the audience to see this, but this is per, this is, uh, per capita rates of, uh, or excuse me, the number of farm animals who are slaughtered every single year in the country, all the way to 2007 where we reached a peak at 9.5 billion animals slaughtered in our, in our slaughter plants, and then it all started going downhill. In fact, in the last five years, we now have had a decline in 400 million animals, 400 mu million fewer animals slaughtered this year than five years ago. That's more animals than are killed by vivisectors in the US, more animals killed by hunters, more animals killed by the fur industry. Every single form of animal exploitation combined nearly, that drop alone is more than that, something that we truly ought to be celebrating. New York Times had a great piece on this, we're eating less meat. Why? They talk about the fact that USDA projects that meat and poultry consumption will fall again this year to 12.2% less in 2012 than it was in 2007. Why is this? Why do we see for the first time in about 70 years of American history meat consumption finally declining? Well, we don't need to wonder. We can look at what the meat industry's own economists have to say. You can look at the Pork Network's articles on these. And what do they have to say? Yes, part of it is due to ethanol. Demand for corn increases corn prices, increases meat prices, Generally, when things get more expensive, people buy less of it. However, they all, these economists for the meat industry also note, add in the efforts of a large number of non-governmental agencies that oppose meat consumption for reasons ranging from the environment to animal rights to social justice, and one can conclude that it was amazing that consumption held up as long as it did. <laughs> Give yourselves a round of applause. And we're seeing the effects of this. You can read the restaurant industry's trade publications like Nation's Restaurant News, Meatless Menus, Veggie Heavy Brands see growth in sales and popularity. You can see this uh, food consulting service report. Western consumers are cutting back on their meat consumption. It's hard to see, but it says the war on meat, how low meat and no meat diets are impacting consumer markets. Another Nation's Restaurant News piece in which they looked at the top 50 trends, the game changers in the food industry. And number seven, number seven out of 50, Meat-free menus, vegetable dishes, yep. The writing is on the wall. We're seeing what the future is because we are living it here because of your efforts, because of your efforts to shine a light on what is happening in the meat industry to these animals. We're seeing falling rates of animal consumption that is literally saving hundreds of millions of animals every single year. Now, it should have happened earlier, but Let's take a look and see what the agribusiness's own folks have to say on these particular issues. Well, many of you may not have read contemporary issues in animal agriculture, but if you have, you might see that Peter Cheek, who coincidentally is Robert Cheek's father, interestingly the author of this book, that's a standard textbook used in animal science and agricultural classes. Here's what Professor Cheek had to say. One of the best things modern agriculture has going for it is that most people haven't a clue how animals are raised and processed for modern animal agriculture. The less the consumer knows about what's happening before the meat hits the plate, the better. We're seeing Feedstuffs, the Wall Street Journal of the agribusiness industry, with an article, Ag's Go-To Messages Not Resonating, saying that this one meat industry consultant advised not going into a lot of detail about current practices when talking to consumers as it may generate more concern than necessary. More concern than necessary? How much concern is necessary when we have millions of breeding pigs locked inside of these crates, barely larger than the volume of their own bodies, lined up like parked cars, unable even to turn around? How much concern is necessary for the plight of these animals? Well, let's hear what meat industry front ran Rick Berman from the so-called Center for Consumer Freedom has to say about these gestation crates. He advises his clients, the people who pay him in the pork industry, to call them individual maternity pens. 
Wouldn't that be nice? Individual maternity pens? Rick Berman and his funders in the meat industry want consumers to be in the dark. They want people not to know about gestation crates. They want people not to know about battery cages. They want people not to know about the hideous horrors that are inflicted on billions upon billions of farm animals in our country every single year. And our job as animal advocates is to not allow this darkness to prevail, but instead to shine a light, to shine a bright light on an otherwise dark and often hidden world of factory farming so that Americans can see for themselves what the result of our current diet actually is. And that is the result. Gestation crates, battery cages, veal crates, the list of horrors is virtually unending. But awareness about these issues is changing what people are eating, it's changing what our laws are reflecting. Just 10 years ago to this day, in August 2002, there wasn't a single law criminalizing any standard factory farming practice in our country. You could do virtually anything you wanted. It was a barren landscape as far as legal protection for farm animals was concerned. Today, we have a not yet the lush rainforest that we all would like to have, but we have growth. We've seen nine states pass laws to ban various inhumane practices from gestation crates to veal crates to battery cages to tail docking to force feeding for foie gras and more generating the foundation upon which we can truly make progress for these animals as far as getting legal protection from abuse for them. What does the Animal Agriculture Alliance have to say about these wins? Well, let's ask their president, Kay Johnson. She says, this is the kind of thing that nobody believes you until it's happened. But in the last five years, it's been like a wildfire. These groups, you and me, are winning. And indeed, winning is what we're doing, time and time and time again. We're not only winning passing these laws, but we're helping Americans go from an inhumane diet to one that is a bit more humane. <laughs> so, you can help. You can help accelerate this trend. Each and every one of us in the room has the power, whether we knew that we had it in us or not, to make this trend go faster. By continuing these positive trends into the future, we can spare hundreds of millions and indeed billions of animals from horrors that are almost unspeakable. So, how can we do it? Well, let's take a look at what the polling shows. The latest polling on vegetarian rates among American adults shows that about 5% of us are either strict vegetarians or vegans. However, take a look at this. It looks that more than half of my meals, more than half of our meals, 16% of Americans aren't eating animals, 16%. That means that these so-called meat reducers, these people who are vegetarian more than half the time, are actually sparing more animals than the 5% of us vegetarians and vegans, just numerically alone. So we haven't seen yet the trend in terms of a massive increase in vegetarianism, strictly speaking, but we are seeing a real increase in the number of meat reducers. Americans are continuing to reduce our meat consumption, and this will have positive effects for animals, for public health, and for the environment. And we need to make it easy for people. We need to welcome them in and let them feel that they are taking positive steps in the right direction when they make these types of choices. One person who has been a pioneer in terms of making it easy for people to make meat-free choices is actually in the room with us right now. Please give a warm round of applause to the man himself, Seth Tibbet from Tibbet. Seth, stand up, stand up, right there. Give him a round of applause. Yeah. When I first became vegan 19 years ago, Tofurky was there for me, and he's been making it easy for so many people before then, since then, and will continue to make it easier. But it's not just Tofurky. For basically every animal product out there, we need to show people that there is an easy, delicious, and convenient alternative. If it's pigs they're looking to eat, let them eat pig, pro pro pig products that are made from plants. If it's chickens, let them eat plant-based chicken products. If it's turkeys, let them eat these plant-based turkey products, including tofurkey deli slices, which are awesome. You gotta try them if you haven't. The chorizo, oh my god, you gotta try the chorizo too, by the way. <laughs> 
um, but we're making real progress. We're making it so easy for people to make these types of more humane-minded and health-minded decisions. If you want to use HSUS's guide to meat-free meals, I urge you to please pass them out. I'll send you over many you can use. However, if you don't want to use that, maybe you can use Oprah Winfrey's online vegan starter kit or Ellen DeGeneres's Going Vegan with Ellen. Cultural icons today, Oprah and Ellen, are talking about vegan eating and, and touting the benefits of this kind of a lifestyle when, when, when Seth started Tofurky, people didn't even know what this word meant, let alone how to pronounce it. And now we have the cultural icons who have taken this concept that once was in the fringe and brought it firmly into the mainstream. You can tell your friends about how even environmental groups are getting on board. The Environmental Defense Fund is telling that if people skip just one meal of chicken per week and substituted it with vegetables, it would be like taking more than half a million cars off of U.S. roads. Or the Sierra Club asking people to green their New Year's resolution by eating less meat, saying that if Americans reduced our meat consumption by just 20%, it would be as though we all switched from a sedan to a hybrid. If your friends liked an inconvenient truth, but they forgot to look at the website and see where Al Gore was urging people to eat less meat because it wasn't in the film ashamedly, now he's out there saying he's cut back sharply on the meat that he eats. And speaking of the Clinton administration, the king of politics himself, Bill Clinton, touting on CNN, that he's gone on essentially, what he calls an essentially plant-based diet. It's not just the king of politics, though, who's getting into the vegan eating issues. Even the king of the ring, Mike Tyson, a man better known for eating a human ear <laughs> than for eating an ear of corn, saying that it's been two years since he was vegan and it's an awesome feeling. I mean, who would have imagined that this cast of characters, Oprah, Ellen, Bill Clinton, Mike Tyson, and more, all touting the benefits of vegan eating? The future is here. Nobody would have predicted this type of stuff five years ago. Imagine what it's gonna be like five years from now. Even Al Sharpton saying, talking about his own diet, saying he overhauled his diet, first he gave up meat and then chicken, and then talking about another type of king, not of politics but, or of the ring, but of Martin Luther King Jr. and his late wife, Coretta Scott King. I also kept in mind the words of another vegetarian friend, Coretta Scott King, who always spoke of the ethical reasons to give up meat. We're seeing, yep, give, yeah, give, give Reverend Al a round of applause. There you go. So, we're also seeing major food service companies like Sodexo getting involved promoting Meatless Mondays, getting their people who go to the thousands of Sodexo service cafeterias around the country getting involved in meat-free eating starting with one day a week. And Sodexo is so into it that they published their own survey in which they found that three quarters of their participants consider the promotion to be easy or very easy to implement. And you wanna know what it looks like implementing? You wanna see what the point of purchase materials look like in these cafeterias? This is what it looks like when you go to their cafeterias. Have a healthy Monday. Go meatless at Sodexo's cafeterias. Who would have ever thought that the concept of meat-free eating would be this mainstream so fast? It's become so mainstream that even major magazines like Time are doing their own features, the meatless and the less meat revolutions. Again, this is an issue that once was relegated to the fringes. Now we find ourselves firmly in the mainstream. The LA Times talking about more vegans and vegetarians fueling the meatless market. USA Today talking about meatless meals gaining in popularity for budget and health reasons. Our movement has come a very long way since the days that Seth Tibbet founded Tofurky. Our movement has come a long way from the days when, when I first became vegan, people didn't even know what the word meant, let alone how to pronounce it. You couldn't find soy milk in any places. You couldn't find almost anything. And now we find ourselves with this type of a situation. Imagine what the future holds for our movement. It is so promising. I hope that each and every one of you feels so fortunate to be a part of our great historic movement at this time because you are living through this major societal transformation. But as far as we have come, as far as we've traveled, we still have a very, very long way to go. We can't just focus on the progress and ignore the reality that billions of animals are still locked inside of factory farms and going through our slaughter plants. We can't ignore any of these horrors that befall them. But I think that we can take solace when we think about somebody like Matthew Scully, who talked about what being an animal advocate is really like, 
And he wrote in his great book, Dominion, where he said, how we treat our fellow creatures is only one more way in which each of us every day writes our own epitaph, bearing into the world a message of light and life, or just more darkness and death, adding to its joy or its despair. By being a part of our movement, each one of us can help write our own epitaph. Each one of us can help bring more light and joy and life into the world rather than adding to its darkness, to its despair. Each one of us can say that when people are thinking about this, you know what, it was hard. It was really difficult. People had a hard time imagining when our society would reach a day when we wouldn't view animals just as mere commodities. People would have a hard time imagining a day when our relationship with our fellow creatures on this planet was one that was no longer based on violence and domination, but rather based upon compassion and respect. And they'll say, you know, that seemed impossible. But it was Nelson Mandela who said famously, it always seems impossible until it's done. And that's exactly the task that, that we face, is doing what many people would say is impossible. Five years ago, people would have said it would be impossible that we'd have a 12.2% decline in meat consumption in our country. They would have said it would be impossible to see a former president becoming what he calls essentially a vegan, becoming having these major leaders like Oprah and Ellen talking about vegan eating. People would have said that was impossible. But I don't have any doubt that we will reach a truly humane society where we do view our relationship with these animals that is based upon compassion and respect. And when that day comes, people are going to look back and they're going to see these images of pigs in gestation crates. They're going to look at these images of hens in battery cages. They're going to look at these images of calves in veal crates. And they're going to look back in utter revulsion at the ways in which we so commonly abused farm animals in our era and the fact that too few people stood up for them. Too few people lent their voice to them. But each and every one of you, by being a part of this great movement of ours, has a chance when that day comes to say, you know what, I was there. I didn't sit idly by on the sidelines while animals on factory farms were suffering. I didn't stand idly by and let somebody else do the work. Just like these conferences don't put themselves on, campaigns don't wage and win themselves. Laws don't pass themselves. Leaflets don't pass themselves out. It only happens because tireless, dedicated animal advocates get off of their couch, get into the streets, and start talking to their friends, to their families, to their neighbors, to everybody in their social circles, and posting it on Facebook and on Twitter, having them over and serving them some tofurkey or some other products. This is the way that the movement will continue to move forward. And each and every one of you should feel so proud to be a part of this, and that you'll be able to say that I was there, that I provided a voice for those voiceless animals, that I did shine a bright spotlight on the very dark world that animals too often inhabit, that we did not let these animals suffer with nobody caring about them. I can't tell you how proud I am to be a part of this movement. I can't tell you how proud I am to be associated with each one of you who are also part of this great movement of ours. These animals can't wage or win campaigns on their behalf. They're counting on us to do it for them. And I can tell you, after being here for the last few days and talking with so many great, tireless, dedicated activists toiling out there for animals day in and day out, that we're not going to let them down. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, that's okay, that's okay. No, more, more, more. Thank you. you can get in touch with me by emailing me at pshapiro at hsus.org. I'd welcome anything you have to say, questions, comments. You can follow me on Twitter at pshapiro, or you can like us on Facebook at hsus farm animals. Again, thank you very much. <laughs>